Hello and welcome back to the smoke room. We will be continuing where we left off in William's route. Uh, last we saw in from Will, uh, he, Nick, and Sam had just ventured into another mine opening that nobody really knew about that's near Lake Emma. And if you choose the wrong choice, Sam ends up dying. So, yeah. But, oh, and you guys should have seen that if you were watching the videos from before. And it, pretty funny <laughs> um but anyways afterwards they um i think it was william that realizes that he's not really acting himself right now that he's being a little too pushy and he's apparently seeing and hearing things or maybe just hearing i forget so yeah uh oh and they were also having a little picnic with uh murdoch and cliff so yeah uh also, you guys didn't get to see the picture. I think now you will. So, let's see. The picture's done. Already? I bet it came out beautiful. He hands the small piece of paper to me. Fuck. Murdoch dismisses me with a showy hand gesture and walks back over to Cliff's blanket. It doesn't look like... There's much else that we can do today, so we spend the rest of the Sunday relaxing. I look around, and it seems like everybody's had their fun. But I can't help but feel like most of the day was wasted. Nick looks like he's finally eaten enough, resting against the big rock. Murdoch is combing the sand out with his tail. Cliff is drawing. And William is... Well, he's staring at the water. Probably stewing about the cave. He does that way too much for somebody his age. Makes him seem decades older than he really is. So I sit next to him and stare with him. And just what are you up to? Just joining you, I suppose. Well, I'm just studying the shoreline a bit more, thinking about those tunnels. I'm just staring at the water. Wondering how many people have died here since the dawn of time. Thinking about wet things again? I feel my eyes flutter from the audacity of that comment. My ears are twitching now. Kind of pissed off how funny that was for something so rude. Lots of things are wet, William. He gives me another look. Christ's sake, he's not gonna drop it, is he? So, you've been working non-stop? Don't laugh, damn it. Not here, William. There we go. Why are you doing this right now? Because I like it when you laugh. You come back to life when you do. That's... Strangely sweet. Therefore, I don't entirely trust it. Keep that up and you two will start to have more in common. Who? I tilt my head and look past his shoulder. I glance at the direction of Mr. Tippett's again, who's squinting at his book and framing a landscape with his stubby little digits. That wipes the smile off his face. Hardly. I feel myself smirking now. You so sure? He pinches the bridge of his snout. Yes. I never put you and everybody else in danger like that. People like us... I mean, I shrug at him. People like us always end up in danger anyhow, don't we? Well, that's what's nice about the West, Sam. Everybody gets to be in danger all the time. Yet you keep saying that the Windy City is more exciting. Well, sure. But all you have to avoid there is upsetting the wrong people, and then you can do whatever the hell you want. Bitter much? Look who's talking. It's just... All I'm saying is that maybe something a little more exciting would be good for me. The good kind of exciting. The kind that keeps you busy. Don't you miss that? I take a look at the murky water again, and it seems just a little more stagnant. I miss a lot of things, Sam. But some of the days I miss look an awful lot like this one. It sounds like he's about to say something else, but then he doesn't. But in all seriousness, Sam, it's time to head back to the station. 
Today went nowhere, so I want a fresh and early start tomorrow. So let's go then. The big coyote puts his hands together, getting ready to shout. Up and at him, boys. Me and Sam are gone. Nick sits up, dusting off his jeans as he rises. Well, this was nice while it lasted. He looks at me, then looks away. I guess he's still upset with me. His gaze shifts to Will again. Mr. Tibbetts should sleep at the station if he's still a target, correct? Yeah, Will. This way you can keep an eye on him at all times. Will crosses his arms. If he needs the assistance, then he's welcome for the night. The weasel holds up his paw. Now, now, enough doting. I can handle myself fine, thank you, and I live close enough to the station that it would make a little difference whether I spend the night there or not. Plus, I don't mind watching over him tonight. More like I'm watching over you. Grazed or no, with that wound you're still a proper invalid. These two are getting, uh, awfully chatty with one another. Sounds like you just volunteered to change my bandages then. Professional fencers are no strangers to blood and nicks, you know. Nick puts his hands on Will's shoulder. Do not be discouraged by today. You work hard. But sometimes our heads work harder against us. Useful lesson, no? Something like a look of realization spread across Will's face. Shoot. Speaking of hard work, I won't be able to see you until the weekend, won't I, Nick? Likely no, unless you can make use of me after 7pm and before 11. Until later, Will. He turns and looks me over. Samuel. His voice is a bit stern with me. But at least he's talking to me, I suppose. Yeah, later. We're off then. William, Chapter 3 Is it getting dark already? 9.15 p.m. Which means it's really 7.15. 7.15 here, anyway. This watch has never been wrong before. Maybe a bit too flashy for me. But never too fast. Never too slow. It just keeps on going from one day to the next. It's even waterproof. That's what my first boss said, anyways. Waterproof by Georgia. God, he was so proud of that. As if anybody gives a shit if a wristwatch is waterproof or not. I feel my muzzle split into a grin. But only for a bit. People get nervous when I smile. That's not the case with Sam, though. People around here have come to expect a sort of coldness from him. So when he smiles, it looks sweet enough to thaw a winter. But he's in a bad mood again. It has to be because of Nick. There's still some frostiness between the two of them. It ain't usual to see Nick that distant from Sam. But then again, Sam has been treating us like strangers for the last few weeks. At least, I know he's not lying to me anymore, now. But I guess, what's good enough for me ain't always enough for Nick. It's a good thing that the weasel didn't come with us. The both of us don't need to be more on edge. I'm glad he said no when Nick suggested to stay at the office. Because he really should say no. At least, if he has any shame. He already put Sam in danger. Twice. 
If his mouth leads a goddamn lynch mob to Sam or Nick and gets him killed, I might end up enjoying the next one. The bullet already broke the skin on the Burns boy. But he put himself in the way. That fox always wants approval too much. Maybe. God damn it. That's not important now. What is important is who placed a hit and if they placed another. Huxley Green wouldn't leave his wife over a grudge from a stranger. He's too controlling. So where did he go? And what did he do with the gun? I just need to move faster and think about what I already know. Christ. It's hard to focus on anything when I'm annoyed. Hey Sam? I hear him padding behind me, but his breath is louder than his footsteps. Can we talk about what you said at the lake a little more? I hear his footsteps stop. Which thing? Let's keep walking. Okay. But which thing, William? The thing about needing more excitement. You've been thinking about leaving town for a long time, haven't you? Even before the night you told me about earlier. And if I have? His tone has an edge in it again. I'm just curious why. Things ain't easier just because you go someplace else. It ain't about things being easy. It's just something about this place. He lowered his voice. And the brothel. Most folks I talk to there feel the same way. Like this is a place you move to. You stay for a while and then you keep on moving once you scrape together enough money. Everybody's just constantly coming and going. Sometimes it feels like the whole goddamn city is a glorified train station, and the only people who stay behind are the ones who lose their fare. Me and Nick aren't stuck. Nick will be gone the moment he finds gold. I think he deserves a little more credit than that. And you're out of a job the moment the public turns against you. You planning on keeping that badge forever? Or did I miss you building houses on a day I wasn't paying enough attention? Because if you ain't, you're on your way out, too, as far as I'm concerned. What a mouth. There's not a whole lot of competition for this job in this location, Sam. But you're right. If I'm out, I'm out. That being said, as far as I'm concerned, pessimism is only for losers. Whatever, William. So that's it, then? This is just a transitional period for you? You probably planned to leave before you even arrived. I can't completely blame you. My life has only ever been transitional, too. Always coming. Always going. From place to place in one of the most transitional places in the country. I've never seen hundreds of new faces I couldn't recognize every new day. Our lives shared briefly. Our time cut short chronically. Viciously. By the L train. By the streets. By the churches. The businesses. The people. You find yourself begging for the transitions to end. No matter who you are. Or what you do. Or what you live. There's always another train stop. Tick tock says the clock. How much of my life have I spent thinking it was another transition? How many baseball games did I end in my head early because I knew my team wasn't going to win? Too damn many. William? But it doesn't matter if I'm here or there. You have a thoughtful look on your face. Because the transitions? I want to know what you're thinking about. They never stop. I'm just enjoying my drink. Despite how much you want them to stop with you. You never enjoy your drink. Because they can't. Today I am. Your life transitions still, no matter where in time your mind is stuck. I have something that I have to tell you. Then what is it? Sam? 
What is he? Hello? We're staring at the front door of the department. I could have sworn that we still have half a mile to walk before we got here. I think you should stay here for the night again. That's kind, but I have my own bed. I meant that I'd pay. Oh. I'll have to increase the rate to justify spending the night. Done. I, I didn't say how much yet. Better describe indoors then, yeah? Yeah. I finally managed to fish the goddamn keys out of my pocket and fit them into the lock. I, uh, would feel more graceful if I weren't bumping into the lock. I won't be damned by how stiff my gait is when I'm inside. We sleeping near the jail again? No. My bedroom, upstairs. Oh. I've never seen it. It's messy. I don't mind. I do. But it can't be helped. When we climb the stairs and reach the foyer, the tobacco smell is cloying. How much do you smoke, William? That ain't my fault, though. At least not entirely. The place reeked of cigarettes before I moved in. Pipe smoke smells a hell of a lot sweeter. I'll get used to it. You usually reek of something or other. You're no better flowers yourself when you get riled up. At least I use cologne. You mean perfume. I mean cologne, William. Soap and water's just fine. I open the cupboard and fetch a glass and the whiskey bottle. Need a drink before we start? Not much in the mood to drink. Suit yourself. I pour myself a shot and wash it down. The burden wakes me up a bit. Pressure in my pants is starting to hurt. My bedroom. I jerk my head and he follows me down the hall. Christ, that was exhausting. What the hell got into me last night? Somebody's banging on the door of the office downstairs. It's morning? Shit. I don't remember us falling asleep. But we did so much I must have conked out. Sam is on his side with his back to me and his tail resting between my legs. I check my watch. It's almost 7am there, so 5am. Shit. I touch my temples and rub. Then I shake his shoulder. Time to wake up, sunshine. Already am. What the? I stop shaking. And when did you get up? Can't be sure. Feels like hours ago. You get enough shut-eye? Enough, yeah. Say, William? He still hasn't turned around yet. He's looking up the walls. Are the walls in this building hollow? A bit of a queer thing to say. Especially first thing in the morning. Sounds don't get out too well, so they're insulated with something. Why do you ask? He turned around, still looking up. Heard things crawling around. Sometimes it sounded like something was going to break out. Sometimes I have to wonder if his head is completely okay. That Jack fella really fucked him up. See any cracks in the walls then? No. At least, I don't think so. Then tell me if you do. I glide my hand over his shoulder, but take it back as he sits up. His back is hunched, his head is hanging low. He could probably use some water. Jesus. That banking just gets louder. And better not be Todd. I peek through the shutters and guard my sunlight from my eyesight. It's him. I've told him a dozen times where the spare key into the office is. Though, it's not like I can complain. I just slept in and got caught with my pants down, so to speak. Let's fix that. I get dressed as quickly as I can. Then I remember that I was in to get Sam some water. Todd can wait a little longer. I fetch a glass in the living room and fill it up, then bring it to him. 
Drink. Some fluids will help you wake up. Who's making that fuss outside? It's just Todd. Sounds urgent. It's probably not. Because if it were urgent, he'd remember where I put the spare key. Might be. But I'm not letting you out of my sight until you finish that glass of water. He glares, then tips his head back to chug it. A bit cheeky, but if it gets the job done. There, all done. He pushes the covers off and plants his feet on the floor a little stiffly, then blinks. His eyes aren't rolling back or drifting out of focus, and his pupils aren't contracting and dilating, so that's a relief. You done staring me down, Sheriff? Is he really going to judge me for staring as if asking if somebody's walls are hollow or not is normal? That's the kind of stuff that makes me worry about you, Sam. No need. My gaze had its fill last night. Must have been hard for you. Todd's still banging on the door. You gonna get that? Not until you're dressed and ready to go downstairs. I'll be quick about that. He steps over his undergarments and drawers on the floor and tugs the fabric up his legs. So you're the one volunteering to get the door then? He waddles towards the shades and tilts his head. Nah. Then hurry up, I have to lock the door behind me. He's mumbling about eating his ass under his breath as if I can't hear him while he snatches his shirt, tucks it in, and then hooks his suspenders over his shoulders. Finally, he's ready to go, and I lock the door on the way out. Todd's still pounding on the door like a madman. Hold your goddamn horses, I'm coming! I let him finish his flurry of blows before turning the knob, letting the door creak open. Well, there you are, Sheriff. He looks a bit of a mess. You should forget about the key, Todd. Oh, right. Well, that ain't important right now. I needed to tell you that I met Huxley Green. Well, that's good news at least. Oh yeah? And what sort of state was he in? Well, none too good, considering he didn't have a head. What? You mean he's dead? Well, that's what the wallet in the pocket said, but I brought his body just to make sure. I grabbed his shoulder to move him aside and see the carcass-sized pillowcase. You dragged this all the way here? I figured you'd like to look at him before the bugs and buzzards got the rest of him. I lift my shirt up over my nose and scrunch down, then shift the sheets off the body. It's frozen, so the smell isn't as bad as it could be, but there are pieces of fur and flesh missing. Those are definitely his clothes, though. I'd recognize Marcy's stitchwork anywhere. And hard to mistake that thick, bald rat tail that looks more like a pale worm than anything else. Yeah, that's probably him. Let's haul him inside. Yes, sir. Todd carries one side and I carry the other into the open jail cell we had used the other night for the same purpose. I check out outside again to see if we've dropped anything, but there's nothing much to look at. I would have thought this man was lying low or, or hopped a train out of town. But something like this in a place like here? It's just yet another thing that doesn't make much sense. Well, you know what they say. When it's your time, it's your time. Who's they exactly? Some Jesuits down the street. The man had his head ripped off. He didn't die of old age. Well, I already know that. I mean, that if he's been dead for, let's be honest, what looks like at least a few days, then he would have had to be real quick about issuing a hit on Mr. Tibbets. See what I'm saying? Todd blinks at me. Come on, you can put it together. Are you saying that he just hated what he couldn't understand? Uh, I'm saying that he might not have placed a hit, Todd. If not him, then who? Now that's a great question, Todd. Now what do you say that we do what we should have done in the first place and pay Mr. Tippett's a visit? I turn and see the red of Sam's eyes staring from my office. 
We'll be back soon. Keep the interior locked. Okay. She disappears behind the window, and we heard the heavy lock of the door click. Shouldn't be long. I don't know if it's true, but he is just next door. So wait, what's Sam doing here at this hour? Debriefing. Technically not wrong. Gee, I guess he does work late hours, doesn't he? He works hard. And there's no shame in that. I didn't exactly say that, Todd. I just mean that I think he must have to do all sorts of really difficult things. I give him a look. You think about those things a lot, Todd? No. He doesn't say anything else for the rest of the walk. When we reach the door to Mr. Tippett's apartment, some things immediately don't make sense. This lock is scratched to hell and back. I swivel the knob to see if it's still locked, but it's completely loose. I told you once, and I will tell you again that you aren't welcome in here. I'll have you know that if you knock down the door, the authorities will be here in an instant. It's just us, Mr. Tibbets. Oh, thank goodness. I heard some of the furniture move around, and something rattles against the door. The door pops open, and the twitchy little man takes a step back. Please come in, I'll put on some tea. What kind? Black with a bit of bergamot, surely. That won't be necessary, Mr. Tibbets, but do what makes you feel comfortable. Just get straight to the point and tell us what the hell is going on up here. Well, I had thought it was patently obvious that I am frightened, Sheriff. Don't be cute. Frightened by who? Of that brute and bully who calls himself Reed. That wolf came clawing at my door tonight and broke the lock. That's terrible. That's not the half of it. He would have been up on me if I hadn't barricaded the door with all the furniture I could put my together in this ramshackle apartment. So, you know it was him for sure. The stoat was filling his kettle and striking a match beneath the wood stove. I'd know that greasy gray fur and those dumpy little ears anywhere. And if I were blind, there would of course be the smell. You know, mustelets get all sorts of earfuls about how we put off an offensive odor simply for our ordinary body sense. But canines have a particular kind of reek to them that's unmistakable. He stops all of a sudden, a bit flushed in the ears. Well, he's right about that, William. I do not give an iota of a fuck about this conversation. Mr. Tibbets, please focus. I'll check with Reed. That's splendid, but I want to feel a moment's peace with that madman on the loose. I'd like you to stay at the station for a while. You think I'd feel safer inside of a prison cell? Nobody said nothing about any prison cells. Willen has a comfy couch in his office. Heck, I've slept there plenty of times. Not on taxpayer dollars, I hope. Todd looks like he just got hit in the face with a shovel. There's no way he'd be able to handle somebody like Cliff on his own. Let's talk about other things to do to keep you safe. He turns to look at me as he's filling metal capsules with dried leaf and flower bundles. Such as? It's common protocol to investigate a victim a little closer after they've been attacked. Helps us piece together a few things. He places three teacups on his little table. I think you'll find I'm an open book, so ask away. Let's start with who you think might want you dead. Seems rather obvious, doesn't it? Just tell me who you think it is. Huxley and Reed, without a doubt. Okay. I watch his expression as he puts down his little teacups onto a table. But who else? His lip curls and he looks sideways. Which probably means that he was thinking about it before I asked him. Hmm... Perhaps somebody who doesn't want me here. Now we're getting somewhere. But why go through all the trouble to use violence to stop your academic endeavor? I leaned in a little bit closer. I hear plenty of stories about how cutthroat a field of academia is without even needing any bloodshed. The kettle whistles. A moment. 
I can tell that he's relieved by this distraction. Sugar and cream? Sugar and cream. So, who do you think might use violence against you, Cliff? Because they don't want you here? He pours his own cup of tea first, then Todd's, then mine. Perhaps some greedy businessman who doesn't see eye to eye with my benefactor. I doubt that I'd know their name. So, who is the benefactor that brought you to Echo? The same man who drew you here, from what I understand. Name him, please. Sorry, but that's confidential. Mr. Tibbetts. Just because I asked you nicely doesn't mean that you can withhold that information. This is basic information pertinent to whether or not your worker's permit can be deemed valid. Well, bend my arm, why don't you? The name, Tibbetts. Very well. Mr. Hendricks, of course. I'm not surprised at all. This is exactly the kind of clown shit that would have his name all over it. But I want to rely on a few assumptions as possible. Could I see your official paperwork? I don't see how that's relevant to anything, but of course. He picks up the satchel by his feet, unlatches it, and then plucks a grey folder from it and passes it to me. I thumb through it. It states his full name, Clifford Tibbetts, and his job title, consultant, in gold letters. Health information follows. This is beautiful stationery. Thank you. I hand it back to him. Government issue typeface is bare bones and clinical. This is a CGCS form, not an official government verification. I'm afraid that my work permit is still moving through the post. If I'm lucky, it should arrive in a week or two, and you'll have your paperwork then. As far as I can tell, everything this man has told me has been truthful. But I can tell that his cards still aren't all on the table. What's something official you have that can prove you are who you say you are? Wouldn't travel tickets suffice, Mr. Adler? It's better than nothing. Well, it's the last thing that I have. He slides me a ticket. It states a passage for one person in an ocean liner, a Cornelius von Hallowick. Your ticket, Mr. Tibbetts. That's mine. This is a ticket for a man named Cornelius. He looks down. And that's my, um, uh, birth name. I don't believe it is criminal to have an alias, is it, Sheriff Adler? Not really, no. Lots of people do it. Especially when they're writing books. It's a bit romantic to be able to choose your own name, isn't it? All you have to do is pick your mother's maiden name as your own, and suddenly you can turn yourself into a sports writer rather than a romance author. You can become anything you want, really. But there's a difference between calling yourself something new and living out a good part of your life as that something. You might not want to be what you choose to become. A life isn't a pen name, or a book cover, or a change of scenery. It's everything you are. My wristwatch sounds too damn loud again. It's just a bit concerning, what with everything that's happened around you is all. Oh, and that's my fault, is it? The weasel sips his tea. Oh, and that's my fault, is it? The weasel sips his tea. You bit off more than you can chew when you took this job, didn't you? Hey! Why are you being so unneighborly with us? The stoke gestures broadly to his wrecked living room. Because I am a little bit frightened right now, Mr. Bronson. I think we want the same thing though, right, Sheriff? I help you unmask some of the monsters trying to murder me, and I just keep telling you the truth like I always have. But just let me hold on to the idea of what I want to be a little longer, and let me keep using the new name. So there it all is then. I can recognize a fair deal when I see one. I hold out my paw to him. He clasps it cautiously. You gonna stay at the station then, or what? Let me go wake up Mr. Burns first, and I'll be on my way shortly. Burns is here? 
He has work early. I didn't want to wake him. I thought you said that you were attacked. You think I can't repose to Mr. Adler? I told you that I can take care of myself. Mr. Burns was running a fever, and he's practically naked at the moment. I'll give you all some space then. Very good. I shan't be long. We waited a while outdoors until we see a very weary looking Murdoch emerge from the apartment. He looks from side to side, rubbing his snout before making his way towards the direction of his father's store. He staggers a bit, but he makes his way there. Mr. Tippetts leaves the apartment five minutes later with a heavy stuffed bag and follows us to the station. I feel like I'm in the calm of a hurricane before the storm comes. I think I was right about disasters following this weasel, but I don't think he's the only one stirring up trouble by far. Considering the way Huxley died, and with Cliff having his ties to James, I'm almost certain now that the rat didn't place the hit on the stoat. But if that's the case, then how did he get the gun? And if Cliff is telling the truth, then why was Reed trying to break into his apartment? Did they plan the hit together, and then something happened to Mr. Green before he lost the gun? Maybe. I have to have a chat with Reed again before I have any reason to believe he has that much spite. Because as of now, that still doesn't make much sense to me. And I'd pin down Reed as a guy willing to get his own hands dirty. Or to start shit when he's bored. He could definitely beat a man to death in broad daylight if he were mad and drunk enough. But plotting a murder while sober? I just can't see it. If the two of them already jumped this weasel in broad daylight, then what's the point of giving a kid a traceable gun to take care of him in secret? Maybe they just fucked it up. Simple as that. Case closed. But then, how did he get his goddamn head severed? I have more than a few things to consider now. I could go to the mayor and have a little chat about how things are going. Anytime, really. He spends most of his time in his office doing nothing when there isn't a ribbon to cut or a speech to unload. And he has no real jurisdiction over me. Or I could go to the stag that Nick and the Burns boy keep bringing up from time to time. It's the biggest men's club in town. And more importantly, I know that the mining union tends to congregate there. Perhaps the suggestion to go wouldn't be a waste of time after all. Trick of thing is, wherever I go first will take all day. If I want Nick's help at the stag, it'll have to be at night. But if I want a more private audience with the mayor, and I don't want Nick there at the stag with me, I should maybe go to the stag first. Regardless, I should install. You're gonna go to City Hall first. Because the stag is more of a night thing. But, that's gonna have to wait until the next episode. Because I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh... Although you guys didn't actually get to see it because for YouTube I have to censor the whole um, intimate scene between William and Sam. But you guys did get to see uh, Sam's sprite. So you get to see, uh, I guess, a better picture of how he looks. Which was surprising even for me because I wasn't expecting to see Sam in the flesh, so to speak. Uh, but yeah. Also... This whole perspective shift reminds me of um, when we had the little perspective shift with uh, Flynn in Echo. If you guys, you know, have ever read Echo or saw my playthroughs of Echo. So I wonder if that is significant or if this is just because it's going to be a, an investigation. So obviously the perspective has to be from Will's side, who's the actual, you know, cop or sheriff, I guess. Mm. So yeah, what do you guys think is going on? We know that there is a supernatural element in this town, at least. At least we've seen evidence of it. So do you think that perhaps what killed Huxley Green is supernatural, or if it's um, regular and somebody just killed him? Mm. Could it be his partner? Could it have been Clifford because, you know... Cl <laughs> I'm sure the stoat can protect himself or something. <laughs> That's highly doubtful. But there's also the... 
the idea that perhaps Huxley Green's wife might have done him in, but in the state that he was found, I highly doubt that somebody as fragile as her could have done it. But then again, we can never discount the wife in a murder. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll find out eventually. So thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play the smoke room yourself, um, you can find it over on itch or you can subscribe to the Echo Project's Patreon to get early access to this as well as other uh, other projects. And also you'll be able to see some of the like um, work in progress artwork for certain other stuff like for right I think it was today or yesterday they released um, some of the the work in progress uh, artwork for Interia and I can't tell you what it's about but you guys will eventually see it I'm assuming and it does have to deal with Amicus and the guy that they said was gonna have to tag along for the whole little tour thing but you know you'll you'll see that eventually I'm sure and anyways, um, if you would like to follow the Echo Project uh, Twitter page, I will also link down for that. And I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next episode where we continue the investigation. Alongside William, obviously. So, uh, bye bye <laughs>